let's move back to Markov state models and how we can do some analysis. So this morning you saw Jan Hendrik very nicely present the, the theoretical foundations of Markov state models, approximation errors and so forth. And one topic that he was touching upon was for instance the uh, eigenfunctions of the, uh, of the, of the Markov state model. And today, uh, so in this session I will briefly walk you through how this looks in the context of the DPCI data that we've been looking at extensively by now. So let's just um, start walking through, if I can get this to work, yeah. So I'm just importing some basic stuff, defining some helper functions that we might need later, loading in the, the trajectory data, and uh, opening and doing clustering and estimating a Markov state model. So this is something that hopefully you will be doing now in the uh, in your own notebook, so you can follow along. Uh, the, the notebook that we're working on now is called MSN Analysis. So this should be also in day two uh, on the Dropbox. Okay. okay, so one thing which is related to the implied time skills that we looked at yesterday, which is hopefully a concept which is a bit more uh, understand by now, it was a bit abstract yesterday for a lot of people. Um, is, uh, so we can look at, at those in a more sort of quantitative fashion, maybe, or in a more detailed fashion to understand when do we have a time scale gap, which is also a, a, a theme that was covered this morning. So what we can do is we can query uh, the MSN object that we have created uh, <coughs> as a function called time scales, and from this we can get out a plot of what the time scales look like. And we see on the, on the, I'm not sure if it's working. I'm not there. It's okay. Um, on the y-axis, we see there's the time scale of a market model, so the characteristic time scale, and then the, the, the different macro processes that are involved with the macro state model. So we see again that there are, there's the one dominant slow process, and there's a second slow process, and then there's some faster processes. So, of course, it's a bit difficult to say when is the exact, exact gap between these time scales. Is, is this significantly different from this, or is this significantly different from this? And, and one way one can take a look at this is uh, by simply computing the ratios of the subsequent time scales, and you can see that once we reach beyond the second process, it's mostly just the uh, noise, fluctuations. And here you can see the, there's a Relatively, this has a relatively large value, and this has a relatively large value, but the other ones are fairly small. So you can say safely that, uh, that there are two dominant processes in at least the way that you have cho chosen to represent your data and the, in the Markov state model that you have resolved. So let's move on to the eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors are uh, representations of your, so as Jan Henrik covered this morning, are representations of what is happening in in each of the macro processes. And there were examples of this shown in this one dimensional four well potential where you saw transitions between different uh, energy wells. And you could do exactly the same with, with Pi Emma. Uh, so you can take the cluster symbols that we have and you can get uh, the eigenvectors, so the right eigenvectors from, from your macro state model object. And then you can plot it on a contour plot. So you can see what kind of changes are happening across the cluster symbols that you have. So here you can see that there's a change from the red area here to a blue area here. And this, if we remember our energy free energy surface, corresponds to there was the two energy ba basins here, and there was this sparsely populated state over here. So it, our markov stud model correctly it captures this transition, so this as, a, as the slowest process. So this is also something which is interesting with respect to Tika, that the, actually the, the slowest Tika picks up this process. Okay, so this is a indication that the, pro the projection we have gives us a fairly good approximation of the slowest eigenfunction, so that we can expect the projection error in this case, for the slowest process at least, to be fairly small. So maybe a quick exercise is that is everybody 
Does everybody follow this? So execute the notebook as we go along. But there's a quick exercise here that I want you to see if you can, just to see if everybody's following along. Uh, I'll give you just two minutes for this uh, because it should be fairly easy. Uh, an exercise would be to say, to look at the, at the next eigenvector and then say, uh, identify what the time scale of this process would be. It should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, if, yeah, let's take questions later. Let's just try to get this shot. Yeah, you're not allowed to look at the screen, what I'm doing. <coughs> okay, so... So the, the trick here is to identify that this function here gives you all the right eigenvectors and this <laughs> subscript here gives you the first one. And then what you need to do is just copy paste this these two lines, paste it in and then put in a two here. The second trick, uh, the second thing you need to observe is that because these eigenfunctions are connected to the eigenvalues and the implied time scales, you can find the time scale up here, so you can read it off the axis here. This is the second point, so it's a, between 15 and 20 microseconds. The first one is around 40 microseconds. So you have a direct connection between stuff that is happening on your cluster centers, like transition from here to here, transition from here to here, or transition from here to everywhere else. These time scales, uh, uh, so these processes have these characteristic time scales that are are given by, by the time scales of the Markov state model. Okay, so another thing you can look at, so uh, apart from the dynamic, so this is some a way of reflecting the dynamics of the system. So you, you get a very nice idea of what is what is changing if you, for instance, combine this approach with looking at uh, with the projection explorer that Yamu presented before. Then you can say, okay, the slowest time scale in my model is a flip of this loop or it's a reorientation of this uh, disulfide bond or it's a rotation of this uh, this uh, rotomeric state uh, which gives rise to some other conformational change. Uh, and and this, is a, so this is a nice way if you want to do a like, mechanistic analysis of your system is to look at what is what, what these uh, eigenvectors they um, what they show. Another thing you can do uh, with the Markov state model object is to look at the stationary distribution. So like the thermodynamics of the system. So they estimated uh, essentially the free energy. So uh, what you can do in this case is to take um, the same plot here. So the same uh, contour plot function, uh, functionality from, from pi emma. And then you put in your cluster centers again and then instead of putting in this value here, you can put in, for instance, in the case of the stationary di distribution, you put in uh, <coughs> stationary distribution. Okay. And then you, what you will see is a plot here where the stationary probabilities of each of the cluster centers, of each, each of the microstates is shown uh, uh, as a function, or, uh, so as a function or in, in this uh, projected space or in this, t uh, this cluster space, okay? So it's a bit difficult to sometimes look at these probabilities, even though everybody loves probabilities, right? Uh, it's a bit difficult to, to look at them because uh, they have a re relatively small range of, of uh, the dynamic range. So one way you can sort of blow this up is by computing a free energy instead. So this you can just do by doing like uh, taking the the, the stationary distribution and then making use of the pi emma functionality. Oh, no, no, this is a non pi. I don't think we can take the credit for creating the log function. Oops. And then you can, of course, put any arbitrary units of energy bef bef before this. And then what you see is. 
something which looks uh, which is a bit easier to understand, uh, like see the exact energy energetic minima in the free energy landscape. And this is, of course, it looks a bit different compared to the empirical free energy landscape that you see when you just take the trajectory data and feed it in, because these probabilities will not be this necessarily be the same as your finite da data, because this is an estimate of the true free, free energy landscape based upon your data, and the other thing is just a sample histogram. So they, they will be different for, for, for this reason, okay? There, are some, there goes a number of assumptions into the estimation of the Markov state model that may improve the estimation of the free energies, um, and it may also reduce the, the quality, depending on your data, of course. Okay, so another thing you can do is, uh, is doing cross graining. This is also something that uh, Felix will talk about in more depth a bit later, but I will just briefly touch upon this subject. Um, so basically, looking at the, at this spectral gap, we can generally say, when, when, when we have the spectral gap, we can get an idea of how many meter-stable states there are in our system. And um, if, we, if we take a look at this, it looks like we will have how many states? Should we say three, maybe? We, I think it should be more or less clear by now by looking at the DVTI that we have three general energetic minima <coughs> in the free energy landscape, and we also expect there to be three. So let's put in three here. We run, we put this number of macro states into this function. We use uh, the object to create, a, uh, so we, we do PCCA using uh, the PCCA function with the number of macro states. And we get back, uh, we save the distributions. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I know how to do this on this. How do you do plus on a German keyboard? Is this something you do? Okay. There we go. Um, okay, so. Can everybody see now? Maybe I should have asked this, okay. So we do PCCA. This is just a function call. We extract the meter stable distribution. And then we do uh, generate some plotting objects. And then we just plot. So what does the distributions of these meter stable state look, uh, states look like? So you can see the, it identifies the first macro state as being high density over here. And this, uh, the second macro state to be high density over here, and the third one to have high density over in, in this bottom corner. So we, we can say that this is sort of a, the, the, the probability of being assigned to a particular macro state. This is what these plots show, okay? And uh, also from this, we can, uh, using these uh, distributions, we can get our representative structure. So this is sort of a complementary way of doing this to what Guillermo presented before. Um, so we can use this sample by distribution where we put in our, uh, put in our meter stable distributions that we extracted from the object. And then we can output them as uh, XTC files, PDB files, as if we want. And then we can look at them in our favorite uh, molecular viewer. Into this fails. And then, so it's been generated uh, some figures here. It's a bit difficult to see, maybe. Um, but then the, it picks up uh, three general, uh, so these three characteristic or representative uh, bundles of structures uh, from the th uh, from the three meter stable states. Um, okay, so let's move on. This is uh, something which will be covered a bit more later. Um, and we can also, of course, look at this. We can also do a crisp clustering. So then we can see the cluster centers. If we force them to be in either one or the other meter stable state, we can see that the separation is also fine. So again, this is something that will be covered a bit more by Felix. So let's move on to, to the real important stuff, is experimental observables, because in the end, we will want our model to somehow reconcile them with experimental observations. One thing is having a model, 
and the other thing is reconciling it with an experiment. So we can you can we can use the Markov state model, the stationary distribution, the eigenfunctions to compute all kinds of different experiments observable. So there's this example that Jan Hendrik again showed this morning with the dynamic fingerprint approach, uh, and then there are all the basic uh, ensemble average quantities that you observe in NMR, small angle X-ray scattering, cryo-EM, so forth, that you can all model also with, with this, uh, within the framework of Markov state model. So let's take a look at, at one observable that we can identify is undergoing a major change in DPTI. This is uh, the distance between these two balls. So in the green and the blue state, it's not changing terribly much the, 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 two, the distance between these two states, but in the red state we can see that it's further away, okay? So we can, we can we choose this as a representative place to do an experiment. We can measure the distance between these two balls. So this is a hypothetical, right? If we then plot how this distance, we can be, so what this does is it extracts the, the, this distance between the two states from uh, the, the, the two uh, spheres from the trajectory and saves it as a time series. And then we can plot this time series like we plot the tickers. And we see that the distance between these two atoms correlates very nicely with the slowest tiger component. So we can see that, so of course this is cheating a bit, but we can see, okay, this, if we can somehow measure this distance, we can test uh, whether this event is actually happening. Or not. Okay. So, is everything, is everybody following along? At this, so you, if, if you wouldn't know that this is a distance, Uh, so this is so this is a different discussion. So you can back <coughs> for instance, you can you can look at your tick components, mm -hmm. and then you can uh, or you can look at your eigenfunctions, and then you can th uh, test a lot of different features like distances and angles, mm -hmm. and then you can see which of them correlates best with my eigenfunctions. Yeah, sure. So an another thing we can do is we can uh, calculate the average distance in each of our microstates. This is what, what one of the helper functions we defined above does. So it basically takes the discrete trajectories, our time series of distances, and then the number of uh, microstates that we have, and calculates a vector of the of the uh, of the distances in each of the microstates. So you can also you can also calculate these mean averages. Um, so you can calculate mean averages in your PCCA space. So if you want to look at the macro state level instead, you can compute this also on the macro state level. So the way that you would do this is simply taking your meter stable distributions, and then you would dot them with the so take the dot product with the the, the, each of the distances in your microstates. This is co computing the expectation value of your microstate. Uh, and so what we could do here is, for instance, we have the PCCA distributions. Okay, so for each of these, we print the the dot product between the PD and then the D min, <coughs> okay? <coughs> and then we can see that the distance in the different, as we expect, the different distance in the different macro states is different, right? This is then taking into account the entire distribution in the, um, in the in the macro in the macro state, okay. And then we can also, of course, use this object here in a similar way as we use the stationary distribution and um, 
uh, and the eigenfunctions to create a, a, a like a plot of how this distance changes in this cluster space. So if we are lazy, we can go up and fetch the the line that does this. So we fetch this. And we go down and we create a new contour plot. And but instead of plotting the oops. Instead of plotting the stationary distribution, the free energy or the eigenfunctions, what we plot is our exper our experimental observable. So we can see that again that there's this this distance is changing from from short distance to long distance along this slow tika. So this is a different way of representing how your experimental observable changes in your in your in your cluster space. Okay, so this is I think also something that can be intuitive to understand whether you, for instance, if you are in, if you are if you don't have agreement with your experiments, like which <coughs> populations might be underestimated or overestimated in your in your sampling. Okay. So the next step is of course simulating an experiment. So simulating expectation values, so like an ensemble average measurement, an NOE, <coughs> J-coupling, RDC, whatever. So in MR observables, <coughs> what you do is you compute this observable for each of your macros, microstates, and then you just use the uh, M expectation, and with your uh, with your micro with with each of the with the vector of your observable in each of your microstates. And this will give you back a value, which will be the average distance uh, according to your microstate model. So this should be, this is the simplest observable that you can, you can compute from a so macroscopic observable that you can compute uh, in an experimental sense from a microstate model. <coughs> Another thing you can look at is, is uh, correlation experiments like experiments that you can measure by uh, FRIP, NMR, or neutron scattering experiments. Um, so for in the case of FRIP, it's quite easy because you can just look, for instance, at this distance, and then you can uh, you can compute the correlation function just by using the, the correlation and then putting the beam in. So that what it returns is, like, uh, so the Times so the time of the a correlation of the correlation function computed and the outer correlation of this function uh, of this observable, and what it gives you is a plot here of what you would observe in if you did a FRIT experiments probing the distance between these two things. So this is the, the relaxation time scale, and here is the amplitude of the signal that you see. The, so it, it does contain the slowest time scale this this relaxation process. But the, the thing is that it's a very small, the amplitude of this process is very small. So if we are in a different case where we say we can, we can somehow prepare the sample in a, such that it's only occupying one of the uh, macro states, at a, at like for instance, by changing the temperature or the pH or the pressure of the sample. So we can make like a temperature jump experiment, or we can make a, a like very quick, uh, change in the pressure, or very quick change in the solvent, solvent conditions in some way, such that we isolate the populate, the start initial conditions of the distributions to be in one macro state. So this is again hypothetical, but in principle, this should be possible. Uh, and the way that we conduct an experiment like this is that we set an initial distribution, which we here choose to be the distribution of the uh, first macro state. And then we use this relaxation process together with our observable. And again, we get back uh, a, a number of times and the relaxation response of this, of this experiment. And here we see that we see a very similar profile as before, but the amplitude it is increased a lot. So this would be a way of saying, okay, uh, even though we don't observe anything in an experiment here, maybe we can try to do a non-equilibrium experiment and look at the relaxation because in principle it should be possible to do this and then you can afterwards test it experimentally whether this is the case. Of course given your Markov state model is realistic, right? So. 
Okay, so and the final thing you can do is, uh, <coughs> like for instance, uh, compare the these relaxation time scales with the with the with the slowest processes you have, and you can see that that indeed so the so the relaxation time scale is equal to uh, so it's the blue line, and then you have the yellow dashed line, which is if you just take the expectation, or if you just do a single exponential decay of your slowest process, and you can see that it's primarily explained by this one. So you can also decompose it into individual exponential decays. Okay, so all of this, so all of these uh, functions, these relaxation and collation functions, there's a lot of of stuff going on behind the scenes is in this, and I think it will be useful for you to to take a look <coughs> at the sort of the backend functions for this, which are Pyema functions. One is called fingerprint correlation, the other one is called fingerprint relaxation. So take a look at the documentations, what are they actually computing, uh, to better understand what is in going on. If you feel like you are confident with this already, uh, you can go on and look at, for instance, one of the papers uh, that, um, like one of the papers down here. So either uh, Frank's paper on fingerprints, uh, Lindner's paper on neutron scattering, or my recent paper on NMR, um, shameless self promotion, and then uh, then maybe you can. Uh, try to explain some of the phenomena we saw above. For instance, why is only the slowest process visible contributing? Maybe you can get some hint from the output of these functions. Um, is it, for instance, possible hypothetically to emphasize some of these other processes in the, in the relaxation part? So some of the other, so the second slowest process, for instance, in the relaxation by preparing it in a different way. 